Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm really excited today to have Andy Shoemaker with us, who's going to help us take a look inside what it looks like from an attacker's viewpoint to try and penetrate a website. Now, for those who don't know much about Encapsula, we are a cloud service that secures and accelerates websites. One of our primary technologies is DDoS blocking. And I'm happy to have Andy here because we think about things from a defensive perspective here at Encapsula. Andy is going to show you what it looks like from the offensive side for someone looking to break into a website. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we will be recording today's webinar, so a, re a replay will be available. If you have questions, uh, please uh, use the chat box. Uh, we'll be calling those at the end for Andy to go through. Also, if we don't have time to answer your question, uh, don't uh, be alarmed. What we often do is create a follow-up FAQ blog post with good questions that we get in the chat box. So feel free to ask away, and we'll get to those, if not today, uh, within the next, let's just say, a couple days to a week in a blog post that we'll broadcast out to the folks who attend today's webinar. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. And really excited to have Andy because not only does he have a great knowledge of DDoS attacks and pen testing, but he's also got a great operational background, which he'll tell you about. So he can give you a perspective from somebody running a very large scale website, as well as somebody who really knows the business of how to break into sites. So with that, we'll turn it over to Andy. And by the way, folks, Stick around to the end uh, after the FAQ, uh, the Q&A rather. We will be showing you how, if you're interested, uh, to get a free trial or a free demo of the Encapsula service for those who want to check it out and see how it actually might prevent pen testers or real attackers from breaking into your website. Andy, over to you. Uh, great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so he hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, I'm Andrew Shoemaker, the founder of Nimbus DDoS, and today I'll be guiding us through a simulated uh, DDoS attack and defense scenario. Uh, so before we start, I'd like to give you a little background on myself. Um, so prior to founding Nimbus DDoS in 2013, uh, I had spent the last 15 years in the operations world, uh, primarily focused on massive scale uh, consumer websites. Um, and as you can see from the uh, list of past gigs here, uh, Many were frequent targets of DDoS, uh, notably TripAdvisor.com and the uh, online poker and casino company uh, that I worked for. Uh, also, please take note of my uh, contact information uh, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about this presentation, uh, DDoS, or would like a copy of the slide deck. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, by all means, uh, if you have any questions or anything, please just uh, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and then here's a little bit of uh, bio that I mentioned earlier as well. So <clears throat> uh, to simulate traffic today, I'm going to be using the Nimbus DDoS platform. Uh, the platform is essentially, uh, it simulates a DDoS botnet using public cloud resources. Uh, and by leveraging public clouds, uh, we can create traffic volumes in excess of 100 gigabits per second. Uh, in addition to sending DDoS traffic, uh, the platform also collects monitoring data uh, of the target, and we're going to be using that to track metrics like packet loss and uh, web page uh, load time degradation. So an obvious question, you know, why would you want to DDoS yourself? Uh, it seems like a crazy thing to do, but there's actually some really good reasons to do this. Um, primarily, it's about preparedness. Um, just like you might perform a penetration test to understand your risks uh, in that world, uh, a DDoS simulation basically falls into that same category. Um, so first, you know, is my organization susceptible to DDoS? Uh, a quick spoiler, uh, unless you work for Amazon or Google, uh, then you almost certainly are. Uh, and if your management, you know, doesn't think so, uh, get in touch with me and I'll be happy to prove it to them. Um, you know, the most common reason we see for DDoS simulation is uh, for folks to assess the vendor solution either pre-sales or after implementation. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to purchase a solution, then discover three months later, you know, during a real attack that it wasn't set up properly. Um, you know, it's just wasted money and time, and you can easily prevent it with just a little bit of uh, due diligence. 
uh, a simulation. You know, it's also a great way to train IT staff. Uh, I think DDoS is sort of unique for most organizations uh, because they're relatively infrequent, but when they do happen, they're extremely damaging. Uh, so giving the IT team a place to become familiar with DDoS can significantly reduce the time to mitigate. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we've been seeing a surge recently from companies who are being asked by their customers whether they have a DDoS strategy in place. Um, this is particularly becoming more common in the financial services world. Uh, so if you live in that space or the SaaS world, uh, it might be good to get out in front of this before the customers start asking. Uh, so now with all that sales stuff out of the way, uh, let's dig into the actual scenario. <clears throat> so for this scenario, uh, we have our test company, Widgets LLC. Uh, there isn't anything too remarkable about them. Uh, they're just a mid-sized company that sells widgets, uh, and their website is their primary marketing channel. Uh, their technology stack also isn't terribly remarkable. It's just a WordPress site hosted on Amazon Web Services. And uh, here in the slide, you can see some information about that stack. Um, as far as preparedness goes, uh, they're like most, most organizations. They perform periodic software updates. They do periodic vulnerability scans. Um, but with regards to DDoS, they haven't taken any special mitigation, uh, mainly because an Amazon rep told them that they don't have to worry about it because they're protected due to Amazon's size. Um, and as you're going to see, this is not really correct. So let's take a look at their website. <clears throat> So as you can see, it's a very typical WordPress site. Uh, in fact, aside from the one test article that I posted that's in the middle, uh, it's a stock AMI pulled from the Amazon marketplace. So nothing really too special there. Um, now let's take a closer look at the target server itself. So in the top window, uh, we can see the NetStat output showing the listening ports on the server. Uh, it listens on SSH and the web protocols HTTP and HTTPS. Um, <clears throat> in the bottom window, uh, we can see the AWS security groups, which show that Amazon is blocking all traffic except for HTTP and HTTPS. So for any of you that are unfamiliar with AWS, uh, this is basically uh, their equivalent to a packet filtering firewall. So now let's go and meet our attacker. So attackers, you know, they range in capabilities from single lone wolf, uh, lone wolf type attackers on one end of the spectrum to organized crime or even nations at the other end. Um, in this example, our attacker is a lone wolf who makes his money from extorting people with DDoS attacks and protects himself by using Bitcoin to hide the transfer of money. Um, much like Widgets LLC, our attacker's capabilities are also fairly modest. Uh, with a very small bot botnet of just 50 nodes. Uh, but with that 50 nodes, he can launch attacks up to five gigabits and five million packets per second. Uh, so I'm sure some of you on the call right now are probably wondering about your own network capacity and how it compares to those numbers. And to give you a sense of scale, uh, I want you to consider that the Brito Lab botnet launched a DDoS in 2010 that was using over 200,000 nodes. Uh, and according to uh, some DDoS experts, in quarter one 2015 alone, there were 25 attacks that exceeded 100 gigabits. So let's now take a look at that widgets website one more time. But this time, let's do it in the shoes of our attacker. So to an attacker, a few things will often stand out. Uh, primarily, primarily, they're interested in anything likely to be CPU intensive or that will hit a database. For instance, the search, the login, things like that. Uh, the reason for this is that dynamic content specifically is more likely to pass through a CDN to the backend servers, causing them to become overwhelmed. An attacker is generally not going to attack a resource hosted on a CDN, uh, since it takes significantly more resources to take a CDN offline than the backend host itself. Um, another likely target is any non-CDN hosted content that is very large. For instance, this uh, uh, image in the center of the web page. Uh, and the reason for this is fairly obvious. In our example, each small HTTP request for that large image results in the victim trying to send a 122K response back. So with some quick math, 
you know, that works out to about 9.7 gigabits of traffic for an attack of just 10,000 requests per second. Um, so, you know, aside from looking at the website, how else do attackers find targets? Uh, my favorite is actually the Humble port scanner. So a port scanner, for those of you not familiar with it, is simply a tool that allows an attacker to probe a network and get a list of what services are accessible from the internet. Uh, there's a variety of, variety of tools available for free. I mentioned one here, uh, Nmap. Uh, and if you aren't regularly using uh, these tools as part of your own security audit procedure, I would definitely recommend adding it uh, to your list. Um, and then one thing I'd like to call out about port scanners is actually the speed at which an attacker can scan a network. Um, with a single modest server, an attacker can easily scan an entire host in less than a second and they can scan an entire class B, which is you know, over 65,000 hosts, in 12 hours. Um, and there's even a tool called Mass Scan that claims to be able to scan the entire internet in under six minutes if you have sufficient network capacity. Uh, so to think that an, att an attacker won't find something is probably uh, a bit foolhardy. <clears throat> so what did the scan, uh, the port scan of our widgets LLC website uncover. So the good news is that it discovered exactly what we would expect and it shows that the Amazon uh, security group is properly dropping all traffic except HTTP and HTTPS. So you know what attack vectors does, does that leave our attacker with? Well the answer is plenty and that's the bad news. <laughs> so um, a bandwidth DDoS is generally the first type that attackers try. And the reason is that its effect is pretty much universal and they're trivial to launch. Um, almost all organizations have a finite amount of network capacity. And it doesn't matter how good your network equipment is if you saturate the physical circuit upstream of all your fancy firewall and IDS hardware. Um, if a bandwidth DDoS isn't effective, then attackers will typically switch to a protocol attack like a SYN flood. Uh, a SYN flood is basically a large volume of the initial packets used for creating a network connection. Uh, and it tends to stress the network equipment, such as firewalls and routers. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we know from the, from the uh, uh, looking at our website, uh, we know that the target is also susceptible to a variety of layer seven attacks, uh, such as HTTP and HTTPS request floods, uh, as well as SSL uh, negotiation attacks. So in under five minutes, we identified 10 possible attack methods uh, that can be used on the target. So <clears throat> next I'm going to walk through a series of uh, recorded videos uh, showing the performance of the target before, during, and after a DDoS. Um, this information has been pre-recorded due to our tight schedule today, uh, but it's based on a live DDoS test using the Nimbus DDoS platform. Uh, it's just that certain periods of dead time have been edited out uh, to make it uh, uh, faster. So let me switch over to that, just one moment. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the top left window is our attacker's SSH window. Uh, the bottom left is an SSH session uh, to the target WordPress system. Uh, the web browser window in the background is the Nimbus DDoS portal, uh, which is going to show us uh, various metrics about the attack. So the first thing we see in the attacker's terminal is that if we load the target website using the command line utility curl, uh, the page loads in about half a second. Uh, and as you can see, it's fairly consistent if we run it a few times, uh, which is what you'd expect from a website performing normally. And so additionally, if we use the netcat utility to create a TCP connection to the web server, we can also see that it's also very quick at around 75 milliseconds. And if we switch over to our web browser and reload our web page a bunch of times, uh, we can see that it loads very quickly and reliably. So again, everything looking normal. And then in our next uh, tab, these are all metrics gathered about the target system in AWS CloudWatch. Um, so a particular note in the graph is the CPU utilization and the network in and out, which I'll pause for a moment. CPU utilization was here, network in and out. Um, you know, both of these are very low, 
which suggests that the server is uh, underutilized at the moment. So now let's fast forward a little bit. Let me get my other video. So now let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, in this next video, uh, a SYN flood DDoS attack has been initiated and it's been running for about 10 minutes. Uh, so at this point, the attack is well underway and we should be able to see some interesting behavior on our target. So the foreground window, uh, this contains the Nimbus DDoS portal. Uh, and I'll walk through each of the graphs to explain uh, what each is showing uh, as we go through this exercise. So let me start this. Uh, so this first graph is the packets per second of traffic being generated by the Nimbus DDoS platform. So this is the actual amount of traffic being sent to the target by the attacker. So as you can see from the graph, our attack is fairly modest at just 500,000 uh, packets per second. <clears throat> Uh, worth noting uh, about all of these graphs uh, is that it's a time sequence graph uh, and the most recent data is over on the right side. So this data on the left, this is obviously before the attack. Uh, this is the initiation of the attack, this ramping up, uh, and then this is the attack underway. So scrolling down, uh, we can see the volume of traffic in megabits per second associated with this SYN flood. Uh, and as you can see, the volume is low at just around 420 megabits per second. Uh, this does raise an interesting point about SYN floods, uh, which is that they tend to be very low bandwidth usage, and it's actually the number of packets that's more relevant to the impact of the attack. Uh, the reason I call this out is because people will often see low usage on their internet circuit and immediately discount a DDoS as the cause because they expect a DDoS to increase traffic, not decrease it. So scrolling down further, uh, we actually start to see the performance data that's being collected by the Nimbus DDoS platform. So this first graph shows the ICMP packet loss to the target at around 90%. Um, as you can see in the baseline data to the left, uh, the normal packet loss prior to the attack was at 0%. Uh, so this shows a substantial uh, impact on network performance. And usually anything over just 1% or 2% uh, will cause some noticeable user impact for protocols like HTTP. And the uh, next graph is the average round trip time in milliseconds. Um, just as with the packet loss graph, we can see a significant impact over the baseline. Uh, it's worth noting that in this test, uh, the monitoring nodes were geographically close to the target, uh, both located in Virginia. Uh, so what this graph shows is a round trip time within the same Amazon region going from sub millisecond to around 50 milliseconds. So again, this is a pretty substantial uh, degradation in, in, in uh, performance. <clears throat> and I think the most telling of all are actually the next two graphs. Uh, so this first graph uh, shows the load time uh, to download our target website. Uh, and again, we see a significant performance hit with page load times going from a baseline of around 40 milliseconds up to 18 seconds, so 18,000 milliseconds. <laughs> so a pretty uh, serious impact. Uh, and then the next and final graph, uh, this is a histogram of successful page loads. So prior to the launch of the attack, 100% of the page is loaded just fine. That's what this is up here. Uh, and then with the attack underway, now less than 10% of pages are loading at all. Uh, and it's worth noting that the ones that are loading, that 5% that or so, are loading extremely slowly as we saw in the graph above. So now let's switch gears uh, over to the attacker's terminal window. Uh, if, if we run the same curl commands as before, uh, you'll see that we don't get the same fast response. Uh, so previously this was completing in about 500 milliseconds and as you can see now it's basically just hanging and we'll just wait a little bit longer uh, there's some information that we'll get in a moment here so we do eventually get some data but even this is not a complete document um, you can see that it actually is a partial html document and it, and it doesn't actually complete and so if we let that run still a little bit longer uh, eventually after about a minute uh, I end up canceling the request in the video. And then if we do a uh, the netcat command again, 
uh, we can see that it just tries to connect, but it's never able to. And it, you know, as a reminder, uh, this was completing in 75 milliseconds uh, before. So again, serious impact. Uh, if we switch back over to our Amazon CloudWatch data, uh, we can see that there has been a measurable increase in CPU usage as well as network throughput, uh, similar to what we saw in the Nimbus portal. Um, it is worth noting uh, that even with the CPU usage uh, at an elevated level, it's still fairly low. So it's only at about 10%. Uh, this brings up a really good point, which is that CPU may not be a good indicator of a DDoS for all attack types. Uh, it can be useful in detecting some attack types, just as bandwidth can be useful in certain attacks as well, uh, but not in all. <clears throat> and here's the uh, network in graph. And then the network out graph is down on the bottom. So now let's see what's actually happening on our target server. Uh, as you can see, we were abruptly disconnected from the server due to a write error. And if we try to reconnect via SSH, it simply times out. Uh, so the DDoS has effectively made our system inaccessible and we have no way to manage the server at this point. We can't log into it. Uh, and since it's in the cloud, we can't even log in through the console. So there's no, no way to get into it. And then you can also see in our other window up on the top, uh, that finally finished and it timed out after over three minutes. So it couldn't even establish an, a connection. And then in case anyone needs any additional proof, our final step is to look at our, web uh, our website and browser. And if we try to reload the page, uh, it simply hangs. You know, it just keeps on trying to spin. So in a nutshell, the target server is down and it's inaccessible both to our web users as well as our, our IT administrators. So the obvious next question is what do things look like once the DDoS has run its course? So now we fast forward it again. This time we're about five minutes after the attack has stopped. So back to our user portal graphs. Uh, on the packets per second graph, uh, things have gone back to normal levels, uh, indicating the, the, that the attack has stopped. So we have our baseline attack, and that stops. And you can see also the same behavior can be seen on the bandwidth graph, uh, with traffic returning to the same baseline as before, indicating that the attack has, has stopped. Now with the attacks complete, we also see performance returns to normal for the ICMP packet loss, uh, the round trip time, and the page load graphs. And I'll scroll through each one of these uh, just so that you can see them. So packet loss, again, it's back to normal. Uh, our round trip time graph, you know, we go from our uh, 65 milliseconds up to 50 milliseconds and then, uh, sorry, <laughs> 0.65 milliseconds and then back down to 0.65 milliseconds. And on the page load time graph, again, we can see that, uh, you know, during the attack, it, we see the serious degradation and then it returns back to normal. And then lastly, on the page load histogram, we see the same behavior. Uh, before the attack, we had 100% success rate, then we had significant degradation, and then it's back to normal. Uh, and that quick return to normal is not uncommon for a DDoS. Um, usually there aren't lingering effects from a DDoS. And now if we switch over to our web browser window, we can again see that the web page is back to normal and we have nearly instant page load times. And then over in our attacker terminal window, if we run the netcat command, uh, again, we can see that this is back to its normal value of around 75 milliseconds, just as it was before the attack. And then running the same curl commands as before, uh, we'll see that the page load time is also back to uh, what we expected from before. So things are looking pretty good. Now, if we uh, switch gears, down to our uh, admin window. Uh, we're now able to log in and administer the server uh, again. And then one interesting data point, uh, if we look at the system logs, we can even see that the Linux server detected this as a SIN flood and attempted to mitigate the attack. So let me pause that for a moment. Uh, so the use of SIN cookies is a built-in mitigation strategy 
uh, inside of uh, basically all Linux servers with default settings. Uh, but as we all saw, this mitigation had no practical uh, effect on shutting down the attack. So how do we protect ourselves? So the first reaction uh, of most admins is to block a DDoS at the network ingress points using a firewall or an IDS. Uh, the challenge with this approach is that it's a substantial administrative burden as it requires admins to become experts in DDoS. Uh, additionally, blocking once the traffic's already traversed your internet circuits, uh, it may not help. The key to blocking traffic is to block it before it traverses your circuits as far upstream as possible. Um, now, if you live in the cloud, uh, you may be able to leverage the elasticity of the cloud to handle the DDoS traffic. Uh, in fact, this is the recommendation made by Amazon for dealing with DDoS. Uh, the challenge with this is that most cloud scaling strategies are not instantaneous, so it may take hours to scale up to meet the traffic demand uh, for a really large DDoS. Uh, additionally, it may not even be possible with some applications. Uh, specifically those that use monolithic databases that might not scale well. Uh, eventually, this also becomes a DDoS on your wallet because you have to pay for those scale-out resources. You know, Amazon's not free. <laughs> uh, another common approach is to use on-premise DDoS mitigation hardware. Uh, this approach requires that you have in-house DDoS expertise as well as uh, network capacity sufficient to handle the DDoS. Um, and so just like with the firewall blocking, uh, you know, a DDoS, once it's traversed your internet circuits, is not terribly effective. Uh, you want to do that blocking further upstream. Uh, now, a clever solution that I've used in the past, past as a temporary sort of fix for a, a DDoS uh, is to hide behind a CDN provider. Uh, so since a CDN acts as a large proxy and they have a large network, uh, you can basically use their resources to protect yourself against most bandwidth and protocol attacks. Uh, the big caveat, however, is that it won't help you against layer 7 attacks unless the CDN specifically offers some DDoS mitigation service along with their CDN offering. And then the last two options are what I would consider the best approach for most organizations, um, and this is to use a dedicated DDoS clean pipes provider uh, to filter the traffic on their, on their network before it even reaches you. Uh, so these services are usually offered in two flavors. Um, one being a proxy-based solution that anyone can use. Uh, the other is a BGP-based solution uh, that can be used by uh, folks that are using BGP. Uh, if you have the option, I would definitely recommend using the BGP solution uh, as it's a much more complete solution and it fully protects your back-end servers. Uh, this, and the services, by the way, that are provided by my co-presenters from Encapsula, they fall into these last two categories, uh, providing dedicated DDoS mitigation on top of a CDN platform. So that's my time, everyone. So uh, thank you. Uh, again, uh, please take note of my contact information. Uh, and by all means, feel free to contact me if you need any assistance uh, developing a DDoS strategy or would like a copy of the slide deck. Uh, thank you again. Uh, so I'll hand it back to you, Tim. OK, thanks, Andy. That was great. Um, so uh, please do uh, ask questions via the chat box. We've got a few come in already that I'll uh, read out to Andy, um, but feel free to ask questions that way. So uh, first of all, Andy, there were, uh, was uh, a question right away when you began. Uh, it was kind of a two-parter. One is, what is the CDN that's being used uh, for your simulation? And the second part had to do with explaining again the difference between uh, static and dynamic content and why that makes a difference. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, so in the example that I used, uh, I did not use a CDN provider, um, mostly because I didn't want to, uh, I guess, sort of muddy the waters of doing the test. Uh, but I think most, most organizations out there usually will have a mixture of resources that are behind a CDN or not behind a CDN. Uh, and usually what makes the distinction between that uh, is dynamic content, uh, which might be pulled from a database or from some other, uh, you know, some other area. Normally, that can't be uh, on a CDN. So it might be accessed through the CDN, but what's really happening is an end user's 
connecting to the CDN, and then the CDN on behalf of that end user is simply passing the request through. So in the case of things like uh, a web page login or a search, that, that query that's being issued through the website, uh, usually that just passes through the CDN provider uh, to the back end server. Uh, so that's why, why attackers typically will target that dynamic content. Uh, so one of the most common ones that people uh, will see is uh, people doing login request floods where they're trying to log in as either, you know, bogus users or whatever. Uh, and what ends up happening there is a lot of times the database that handles the authentication for the login sessions, a lot of times that will become overwhelmed uh, in, unless, unless the organization has really good uh, caching set up. Got it. Okay. Uh, next question has to do with the last part of your demo, and it is, um, is there a way to reach an AWS server uh, if you're under DDoS attack? I think they were uh, asking regarding your attempt to log in via SSA. So is there some other way if you're running on AWS to get into your server while there's a DDoS attack? Um, so uh, as far as I know, and I've, I've used Amazon quite a bit. Um, in fact, they're one of our, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of trash talk them a little bit in the, uh, the, the demo here. Uh, but I actually, I love Amazon. I use them uh, quite a bit as part of our platform. Uh, a lot of the Nimbus resources uh, run on them. Uh, but as far as I know, there's no way to get console level uh, access uh, to an Amazon instance. So when it's overwhelmed by a DDoS, um, a lot of times you're really just kind of out of luck <laughs> until, until the DDoS is over. Um, now, and, and I'll actually point out an interesting uh, thing, which is, my login request that I, would, that I was doing here, uh, I was actually connected uh, through a VPN uh, device, a remote access VPN device on that Amazon network. So I was logging in with my computer, my desktop, uh, through the VPN, and then my, you know, my computer now has access directly on that internal Amazon network. And so my access was actually not across the internet, it was locally within the Amazon uh, virtual private cloud, as they call it, a VPC. And as you can see, even accessing it locally, not across the internet, the instance itself is overwhelmed. So it's not that the internet connection is overwhelmed to the instance, it's that the uh, instance itself, its capabilities from a network perspective were just blown out of the water. <laughs> got it, got it, okay. Um, and uh, another question, again, coming back to CDNs, uh, is can you talk about what kind of attacks, if you're, if you're just behind the CDN without any kind of DDoS clean pipe, what kind of attacks will be blocked and I guess you show us which kind will, can you talk a bit more about that? Yep, that's actually a really good question. Um, I only kind of quickly glossed over that. Um, so the ones that you're going to be protected from just by default, like you don't have to do anything special, like you know, they will instantly be protected, is any of the bandwidth related uh, DDoS attacks. So this would be attacks like uh, just a simple UDP flood where the attacker is sending a large amount of UDP traffic. Um, uh, any of the like DNS reflection attacks, which uh, some of you may have read about you know, in the news, they're kind of uh, the latest thing these days. <laughs> um, but it's basically a large amount of uh, uh, DNS response traffic, but its objective is basically to overwhelm uh, the bandwidth of the target. Um, so any of the bandwidth level attacks, you're going to be protected by those. Um, the same thing goes for uh, SIN floods, uh, because a SIN flood, you're actually not establishing the full uh, TCP connection. So it's it's basically half created connections. So in the case of a, a CDN provider where it's a proxy, the those half created connections are only uh, complete, they're only basically going to the CDN's resources. And until that connection completes and the person sends a request through that connection, it doesn't get passed along to your servers, which are behind the CDN. Now, the type of attacks that you're not protected against uh, they're basically anything that, uh, well, for those of you using a CDN, you know that you have your origin servers, then you have your CDN layer that lives in front of it. Uh, if you look in your web logs on your origin servers, you're going to see, you know, requests for certain pieces of content. 
So that might be dynamic content, like I mentioned, for uh, uh, logins and searches and so forth. Um, or it might just be, uh, you know, uh, content that for whatever reason you don't want the CDN to cache. Um, so any request uh, for any of that type of content, the CDN is basically going to behave like all CDN providers do, and it's just going to pass the request through to you. So if a, an attacker is sending a, uh, a large attack where they're doing 100,000 uh, login requests per second uh, to, your, to your web app, the CDN provider is just going to shoot those straight through to you, and now your origin servers are going to have to somehow figure out a way to handle that traffic, um, which is usually a pretty tall order. Okay, great. I'm just uh, looking at the question now. Uh, I believe it's from Adam. Uh, so it says, does Amazon explicitly authorize you to launch DDoS attacks from their resources? I had read it strictly against acceptable use policy. That's a kind of a bit of a zinger for you, Andy. Sorry. <laughs> it is. Uh, well, so uh, uh, I said we use Amazon. Uh, we don't, well, <laughs> we use a variety of cloud providers, and we do have uh, relationships set up with uh, a few different pr uh, providers, uh, not all of which do we use for actually initiating uh, uh, the actual simulation traffic. Uh, we do use the uh, Amazon resources for uh, the user portal, which uh, you saw in the demo. Uh, that's a, a portion of the user portal. Um, and then also we use that for, uh, we use Amazon as well for our corporate website. Um, but we do have, uh, we do have authorization from them uh, for for the simulations that we uh, do and the, the usage that we use, though. All right, so Andy is not a criminal. That's good to know. <laughs> no, and uh, we actually take uh, all precautions to try and uh, uh, be very good actors in, in the world of uh, DDoS simulation. Um, in fact, uh, you may have noticed, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't point it out, but with the SIN floods, uh, a typical real-world SIN flood is actually usually a spoofed attack where the source addresses are randomized. Uh, when we do those simulations on the Nimbus uh, DDoS uh, platform, we don't do any spoofed attacks. And the reason for that uh, is, is basically because we want to be good actors. Um, you know, from a technology standpoint, we could certainly do it, but we don't want other people on the internet to receive uh, what they call backscatter traffic, which is uh, basically the noise that comes back from a, a DDoS attack to those spoofed people. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, last question is um, from Mohammed. Uh, what application layer controls are required for protection against advanced DDoS attacks? I think he's asking about layer seven uh, attacks. What kind of controls are necessary to stop those is what he's asking. Well, so <laughs> that's where things start getting a little tricky. So um, I want you to all sort of imagine for a moment, um, you know, what, what, is the, what is the worst case scenario for a DDoS attack? Uh, and the worst case scenario for a DDoS attack, attack is basically traffic that looks real. So the more real an attacker can make the, the traffic look, uh, the more difficult it is to mitigate that attack. Um, so again, you know, imagine, imagine if you will, uh, you know, a scenario where, uh, you know, you have a DDoS attacker like with a large botnet. Maybe the botnet is a million, uh, a million nodes which is not unheard of. There are a million node botnets out there. And let's say that each one of those million nodes only sends a single request every, you know, every second to, uh, to your server. So that's a million requests per second, all from different nodes. So uh, when it comes to actually filtering this stuff, if you're a, if you're a sysadmin uh, without specialized tools, it can be very challenging because you're not going to see just a single uh, you know, high bandwidth user or a high request user where you can just look through your logs and say, oh, you know, this IP address, I'm going to block him. Uh, with really large DDoSes, uh, it starts becoming a challenge for uh, like a statistical analysis where you're looking at things like, oh, did suddenly, uh, you know, instead of, instead of having most of our traffic coming from the U.S. is now suddenly uh, more of it coming from, from Europe. So maybe the botnet happens to be a European-based botnet. Um, you know, so you start looking for traffic anomalies like that. And again, that's when you have to start getting into customized hardware um, or, or solutions that are service-based, um, which have underpinnings that are oftentimes specialized hardware. 
Um, and I'm sure the Encapsula folks can actually speak a little bit more to perhaps some of the heuristics that they uh, might use uh, to mitigate some of those advanced attacks. But uh, it, there's no trivial sort of silver bullet answer to that question, though. <laughs> Great. And uh, our last question from screen name op SB, and maybe you could back up a slide, Andy, since you're still the presenter. Uh, he's asking if you could just go over those last two options again and perhaps just give a bit more detail. Um, what is a clean pipe? What does it mean? And, uh, you know, which, what, what do they protect against, I guess, is what he's asking. Yeah, sure. So uh, a clean pipes provider, um, uh, you know, it's sort of a, you know, I, I threw it in quotes there because it's, it's kind of a made-up term. Uh, but basically the idea is that uh, to the outside world, the only thing that people see is the, the third-party vendor. Like they don't see the IP addresses of your machine. So when they do uh, a name, a, a DNS lookup on your website, instead of it showing your resources uh, directly, instead it's going to be a, uh, you know, in the case of the proxy solution I'm talking, uh, it's going to be the, uh, the IP address of say encapsulated servers. And so when, when, a, when somebody initiates a, a web request, instead of it going directly to your server, that's going to go to, uh, you know, in our example, we'll say encapsulous uh, servers. And then encapsulous servers are going to look at that request and determine whether to pass that traffic through to uh, your servers. And the way that they're doing that is really no different than what you might be accustomed to with a CDN, except it's going to uh, run it through a heuristic that's going to try to filter out uh, what it considers to be uh, denial of service traffic. So it's going to do things like uh, looking for, uh, well, whether, whether the attacker even supports cookies. That's one of the, the easiest ways that people can uh, uh, drop traffic is if the attacker doesn't support cookies, chances are it's not a real browser and it's probably something that can be thrown away. Right. Uh, the, the other item, the BGP routed solution, um, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that, but effectively it works the same way as the other uh, solution, except that instead of it being specifically built for uh, web traffic, it actually handles all of your traffic. So uh, for those of you familiar with BGP, um, so, B, well, so BGP is basically a routing protocol where you tell the world how to get to your network. And so the whole world will know, oh, to get to them, I have to go through this uh, provider and, and traffic basically snakes through the internet to get to you. Uh, with BGP routed solutions for DDoS, what you're basically doing is you create a, a tunnel between yourself and the uh, DDoS vendor, so between yourself and Encapsula, and then the BGP announcements are actually sent out through Encapsula. So from the outside world, it looks like Encapsula is your ISP. So all the traffic for your network, regardless of the protocol or anything, anything that's destined for your address space will pass through Encapsula and they'll be able to actually do that filtering on your entire uh, traffic volume, uh, not just HTTP traffic. So that's why I was saying it's a much more complete solution because there is literally no way for an attacker to get to your resources without it passing through the, the DDoS mitigation vendor. Okay, great. So um, thank you so much, Andy, for all those questions. If folks uh, do have additional questions that they you know, forgot to ask or didn't have time uh, to type in or what have you, uh, feel free to uh, either send a tweet, uh, tweet at us, so we're just at encapsula underscore com, um, or you can send an email to, to me, so tim at encapsula.com, or of course Andy has uh, contact info up there. Um, and last thing I want to mention is uh, if anybody wants to see how uh, what Andy described works, uh, definitely the, the proxy-based uh, uh, clean pipe solution is much easier for us to, to show. Uh, if you'd like to see a demo or you actually would like a, uh, a free 14-day trial, which we can set up for you, uh, please drop a note uh, to sales at encapsula.com. We'd be happy to, to show you how it can protect your website. So with that, Andy, thanks again. That was great. I uh, really appreciate the inside look, and thanks all for attending today.